awesome. Well, this morning, uh, I'm excited to preach the word uh, because I believe it's a word not just for you, but this was a word for me. And so God preached it to me, and now I'm gonna try and preach it to you the best way I can. And so uh, if you've got a paper Bible, you're super saved, go ahead and start turning to Daniel chapter three. Uh, if you've got a smartphone or a dumb phone, you can work on that as well. Find it in the version app, uh, Daniel chapter three. And so in Daniel chapter three, we get this account of several boys um, named uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, Rack, Shack, and Benny from VeggieTales, if you've ever seen it. Uh, and so, uh, not the Shack that play with Kobe, different Shack. Um, and so, these are the boys that we see a story in the account of. They're friends with Daniel, so they're in the book of Daniel. And what happens is, is they're a part of a, a kingdom uh, that does not belong to our God, and so they are asked to do something that they don't wanna do. And so, uh, that's what we read today in Daniel chapter three, starting in verse 14. If you found it, say, I got it. If you're still looking, say, give me a second. All right, I'll be on the screen for you. Okay, verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of these musical instruments. But if you refuse, little boys, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God? I don't, I don't like the disrespect of that on a side note. He says, and then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, oh, King Nezi, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. See, because if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, I know you're asking what God, but I got an answer for your question. The God whom we serve. Anybody grateful that you don't serve the other gods of this world, but you serve this God who can do exceedingly. Okay, just seeing where my saints are at. See, but, but if, and if he doesn't save us, <laughs> we wanna make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. And that's the kind of faith that I want. And so I'm gonna preach to you for the next four hours using this as a title. I'm still standing. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, I'm still standing. Look at the neighbor on the other side that you don't like as much as say, hey neighbor, I know you're sitting, but it looks like you're standing. All right, if you believe God will speak to you, give a shout of praise in this place today. All right. So uh, this is one thing I've been dealing with in my personal life. Uh, I've been learning about myself in my faith walk. And uh, one thing that I've been wanting to have in my faith walk is courageous faith. Now, if any of you know this, I think the church in 2023 is having a struggle with a courageous faith. I think that we are not really at the place where we should be at, but most of us don't know how to get to where we need to be at. And so the reality is, is, is I want a courageous faith. I see the Hebrew boys who say, even if he doesn't rescue us, which sounds so beautiful, but it's hard to live. I see this and I'm inspired, but I don't know how to get there. See, because most of the time I want a courageous faith, but uh, for me, actually, I think I have a convenient faith. <laughs> I think for me, I have a contingent faith, meaning that it's unlikely to actually happen even though I seem to be certain. It's contingent upon some things. When it works for me, I got faith. When it's convenient, I got faith. And so I would say, I've got courageous faith, but the reality is, is I'm not committed enough to have that kind of faith. And the reason I know this is because I examine my life from, from years ago and, and I look at when I was a, a young boy and uh, I was very excited about a lot of things. I still am. But when I was a kid, I was real excited about what I could do with $10. $10 could go a long way back in 2015, but it cannot go that far today. Um, but when it could go far, there was a lot of things I could do with this $10. But the thing that I found out was that my appetite would change almost every other day. I'd be like, hey, this is so cool at Toys R Us. Did you see it? You can wind the toy and it walks on its own. This is cool to me. I want to spend $10. Hey dad, I'm gonna spend $10 that I got from grandma, by the way. This isn't your money. I'm not asking for a loan. I'm saying, I wanna use my own money. But then the next day, all of a sudden, this video game came out and I could get a video game for $10 back in the day and I said, I will buy this video game, but this is so exciting. And I realized that day to day, I would change what I wanted. And my dad said to me one time, cause he noticed this pattern. He said, here's what we're gonna do. I know it's your money. I know you want to buy that, but here's the thing. I've noticed about you that you're changing your mind all this time. So what we're gonna do is I will let you buy something if from the day you tell me you want something, you've got to wait a whole week. And if you still want it, then you can have it. I'm looking at this guy. Who does he think he is? 
this is my money. My grandma sent it to me. In my check, it said my name on it. But how many of you know God will protect you? Your father will protect you from spending on what you shouldn't be spending on. And, and so I'm, I'm frustrated. And so I would see something. I'd be like, oh, this, one, this is it, Dad. So you listen. Now, this one was only eleven fifty the next day. And uh, listen, it's only $1.50 more, but it, it's pretty cool. And I, what do you think about? And he's like, okay. I'm like, but so the week started yesterday, right? Right. It was, I started the week that I have to wait yesterday. He's like, no, no, it resets every time. And I got frustrated. And I remember saying this phrase, I will never be able to buy anything at this rate. <laughs> Funny to you, painful for me. And I was like, what's going on here? Why, why can't I do it? Because I've realized that in my life, I want the things that are convenient for me. I've realized that faith is a great ethereal concept. I got faith, but it only works when I need it to work for me. It's easy to praise God in the high moments, but when I'm in the low moments, it's not so convenient for me to worship him. It's not so convenient for me to be able to give him everything. And so when I look at these Hebrew boys, I'm saying, these guys, they've got a different kind of faith. I think this is the kind of faith that gets God's attention. To be this gangster standing, before the king, I will never bow. Never? I remember when you said never, when I said never. I said I would never wear Jordans, but I'm wearing Jordans today. I said I would never go and eat at McDonald's, but I love it. I said I would never. It's a good concept, but it's not real. But these Hebrew boys, they say, but even if our God doesn't rescue us, I want you to know, homie, we ain't never bowing. We're going to be standing because we don't bow to the other things. So today, if you really wanna get courageous in your faith, which I would hope would be all of us, and if you're like me, and you're realizing, oh yeah, I got a convenient faith too, I'm gonna give you four things today that will help you get there. Here's the first one. You know what's wrong with me? Why I have a convenient faith and not a courageous faith? Because I got commitment issues. My wife does not need to be worried. I'm committed to my marriage, okay, slow down. <laughs> but I, I got commitment issues. I, I don't know how to be committed. And I've realized this is a generational thing that's now growing and even worse. Uh, when I look at the uh, dating phase and the dating stages in our world today, uh, some of my seasoned saints, you'll know this, this term, uh, but it used to say when people were dating and together, it would say they are going steady. I'm going steady with Rob. I'm going steady with Rob. You're going steady with Susan. I'm going steady with Susan. It was going steady. That was it. It meant you were together, you were committed, and it was great. But now I got to fill y'all in. The young people know what I'm talking about. Some of my seasoned friends, you're going to be like, what in the world is going on? This is the situation today, okay? Once I see Johnny, oh, I got a crush. I'm crushing. Then from crush, I've got a step to talking. We're not just talking. We're communicating. Thought that'd be normal, but we're talking, okay? That means something. Uh, some people are whispering because it's under the table. But after whispering and talking, then you get to the next level, and the next level is dating. But dating still doesn't even mean that it's just you and that person. You are dating whoever the heck you want. It just means that you're Dating, and then from there, then it gets to the big one, you're exclusive, ooh, that feels good. I know you like me, you like me, we're together, but you gotta ask the question, which phase are we at? And they get to exclusive, and then by research, it says that you're finally in a committed relationship. What does that tell me? It tells me that commitment is under attack. The devil has realized the power of commitment. The power of saying yes is yes and no is no. But it's trying to disciple a generation that says, listen, I'm just gonna start in a talking phase, then I'm gonna get to the dating phase, then I'm gonna get to an exclusive phase. But I think, friend, if we're gonna be honest, it's not just young people in their dating life. That's how I treat my relationship with God. Yeah. Oh, we're just talking at this phase. <laughs> I mean, I worship and I sing the songs on the screen, but we talking, that's it, that's it. Don't ask anything of me. And then I go into this exclusive phase where I'm not serving any other God. I'm with you, but I'm still not fully committed. And the reality is, is I got commitment issues. I wanna serve God, I do, I love him. That's why you're in church, because you love God. You're not here because you hate him. You want to do more for him. You want to be available to him. But most of us struggle with committing ourselves to God. And that's where we're at. But here, let me tell you this morning, can I tell you? Commitment is not casual, it's costly. Any of you know, some commitment is costly. You've gotta pay a price for it. It's not free, it's not free 99. It's more than that. You've gotta pay a real price that actually gets you what it is that you are a part of. And I, I wanna illustrate it to you this way. When we look at commitment being costly, there's a difference between a contract and a covenant. There's a difference. A contract, I love Miriam Webster. The Lord speaks to me through Miriam Webster. A contract is saying, I'm giving an exchange of goods to another person or another thing or whatever. I'm exchanging. 
and when somebody does not feel their side of the agreement, everything is nullified and void. Yet a covenant says, I'm giving of myself to another. And though the other person doesn't fulfill their side of the covenant all the time, I am in covenant, so I've got to choose to be in covenant. And the problem is, is that we think our relationship with God is a contract and not a covenant. We think that there's a list of items that could be in front of us on a piece of paper. And the moment we think that he meets an expectation that we approve of, we're great. But the moment that he doesn't meet an expectation he never even said he would meet, we get upset. How many of you know we call it a prophetic promise sometimes, but it's really just my selfish ambition? Well, God promised me that. Where in the world did you get that idea? Then you get mad at God for not doing something he never said he would do. Friend, he's a man of his word. If he says it, he'll do it. He's in covenant. He's not looking to get out of the situation. He's looking to go through anything to find you. If you read your scriptures, you see that he leaves 99 just to find the one, the you. Because when he does that, it's because I'm in covenant. You're not bringing anything to the table, Josiah. All you brought was your sin so I could pay the penalty for it. But from here on out, I'm gonna chase everything inside of me to get everything out of you. Not because he needs it but because it makes me better for the people around me. And I'm trying to live in a contract. I'm kind of like Russell Wilson. <laughs> Painful for you, Seahawks fans, funny to me. So I'm a, I'm a Washington Commanders fan, so it's not that funny. Um, okay, so anyway, Russell Wilson, for those of you that know, and those of you who don't know, quarterback that played on the Seahawks, no longer plays on the Seahawks, and uh, he was in a contract. And they were trying to figure out, he's like, oh, I want to win three more Super Bowls here. I want to do all these things. I'm going to be a beast. Check me out. I'm one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. He was excited. And all of a sudden, he didn't like how the coaching was going. Come on, somebody, you don't always get to pick your coach. But uh, sometimes he got frustrated. And so he started checking out his options. But what he had his agent do in his contract was put in a no trade clause. That clause doesn't mean he can't be traded. That clause says, unless I know where you're trading me to, and I say, okay, you cannot do that. That's a contract, not a covenant. See, because if he was in a covenant, Russell Wilson wouldn't have a ring anymore because, see, what he thought was, I'm gonna go to a winning team, which was ironic, and he said, I'm gonna get out of Seattle and I'm gonna have a new life and be in this part with it, but I don't wanna go to a losing team. Yes, ironic. <laughs> but most of us, wouldn't that be true that I've tried to write in a no-trade clause with God? Yeah. Wouldn't you say that Jonah perhaps wrote a no-trade clause in with God? Oh, I'll go anywhere you want me to preach the gospel, God, Jonah says. Well, go to Nineveh. Ah, see, what you, see, what you didn't realize is I put a no trade clause in there, God. So what it means is I will not go where I don't want to go. I will only go and do what you've asked me to do where I know I want to go. But the reality is, is we can't live like that. You know how exhausting that is? Trying to fulfill a commitment and say, I want to do this and I want to do that and then get upset with God when he doesn't meet our end of our contract and our commitment. No, no, no. He's looking for a fully invested. But the problem is I've got commitment issues. I don't know how to stay committed. And it's not my fault. It wasn't taught to me. I don't know how to be committed. This is the family that God gave me. What do you want me to do about it, God? This is the situation. God, I just lost my job. You want me to be committed to you still? This is the reality of what I'm living in. And the problem is, is that we have commitment issues. But here's the issue. It's not a lack of commitment. Oh, we are good at committing. We don't have a lack of commitment problem. We've got a location of commitment problem. <laughs> Where are my commitments? Where are they? Where have I placed them? We all place our commitment in something. Some of us are committed to the cash. Whatever I got to do to get this paper, I'll work late at the office. I'm trying to get this promotion. I'm trying to get all these things that I think I should get because I've been working hard for it, not realizing, friends, that we cannot reap from our family when we only sow into our job. We've got to realize that we've got to not be committed to the cash. But some of us are committed to criticism. Oh, you've got to tell me what I look like today. And you've got to tell me that I can't wear these shoes. And you've got to tell me when you like these shoes. And you've got to tell me that I don't want to eat that anymore. And you've got to tell me, well, it's only good for you if you eat that. And we are obsessed and committed to what people talk about us to. Now, some of us are committed to culture. Oh, don't cancel me. I'll do whatever I got to do to make sure that people around me accept me. I want to get what I want to get. And how many of you know you can sometimes even be committed to a good thing inherently, but it becomes a bad thing? How about compassion? Yeah. Compassion is a great thing. 
That means to have empathy, to be moved, to do something for somebody else. But how many of you know the devil wants to twist your compassion and get you to a place where you're such a vegetable that people just walk over you and use you and take advantage of you so that you're wasting your resource? Friend, we are committed. It's not that we don't lack or we don't lack commitment. It's that we are not willing to commit to the right location. And friend, it's what we want to do. How are we going to ever become a church that leads people into something that they've never seen? It's we've got to stop looking like everybody else. And that's what I'm looking at when I see these Hebrew boys who've got this kind of faith. Where does it come from? Their commitment to Christ. Their commitment to the call. Their commitment to go further and farther than anything else. They are committed to what God has said about them, not what man has said. The problem is, I got commitment issues, number one. And number two, I'm committed to the wrong thing, so I am worshiping idols. So if I want to be courageous in my faith, I've got to stop worshiping idols. I've got to stop worshiping things. Oh, I don't bow to a statue. All right, give us scripture. We're not going to talk about the statue, but we are going to talk about the things that we bend our knees to. The things that we move our schedules around. The things that we spend our finances on. The things that we are more worried about while we're sitting, experiencing what God's doing in our life when we're trying to get out and do something else. The things that are constantly on our mind that we can't put to rest. We have things that we bow our knee to, that we bend our knee to, because we think that it will give us something that it really can't give. And that's what's dangerous about an idol. It's a transfer of trust. When you give your life to an idol without even recognizing it, what you're saying is, is I honor you and I give you authority in my life. That's what trust means. That's why when I sing a song, I trust in God, what am I saying? I'm prophesying to every piece inside of me that no, I will not give anything of me to anybody else. I will not look for satisfaction in anybody else. I will not look for commitment from anybody else. I won't look for the, the comfort that I could get from this thing over here any longer. I am giving of myself to him. I trust in God. Oh, it's easy to say, but it's harder to live, is it not? We've got to find ourselves in the situation where we are worshiping idols. And the reason we worship them is because we don't even realize until they've got us in way too deep. Oh, I didn't even know I had an idol. I didn't even know how I got here. I'm just struggling. And the problem is, is that we are way too committed to these other things. And I want to tell you, friend, the worst part about an idol is that it wants you to pay for what's already been paid for. This is the thinking that we get when we serve an idol. If I sacrifice enough, you owe me. If I give up my time enough to this thing, then surely I'll get the peace I'm looking for. If I give enough of my resource to this subscription, then finally I'll get that sense of comfort that I need. If I sacrifice enough, then I will receive it. And you know where that comes from? It comes from a fear of loss that is deep inside of all of us. Which is ironic because if you were to ask somebody, what would you give up to not lose everything. You know what they would say? Everything. So how am I not losing everything by gaining everything or giving up everything to not lose everything? We've got this irrational idea in our mind that we can get something from something other than the creator. No, no, no. He knows the nooks and crannies. You don't. He looks and sees all these things inside of you. I could never realize what my deep insecurity is. That's why when I get mad at somebody and I get upset and all of a sudden somebody says something to me and I lash out, I've got to ask myself, where's that insecurity coming from? Where's that thing inside of me coming from? Because that's not them. I can't blame them. That's clearly something on the inside of me that I haven't dealt with. There's clearly an idol inside of me of feeling comforted. So when you said that, even though it was true, it really hurt me, but I'm just insecure. And we find ourselves in this predicament today where we want to be courageous, but the problem is, is we can't be courageous because we've got idols weighing us down. In our culture, we do. All these, you are discipled to give in to the instant gratification. You are discipled to give your life to the thing that's in front of you. You are being pushed to your limits to give in to the subscription. And the problem is, is you don't even know what you're signing up for until you look back and say, how did I get here? <laughs> and can I tell you, that's the same way with the faith. The same way that evil and idolatry works is to get you from A to Z without you recognizing it. Friend, it's the same way with your faith. I would be an idiot to think that I can do 10 sit-ups, look in the mirror, and I'd have a six-pack. Dumb. 
It doesn't work like that. I've gotta be committed to a process because to get to a place where I can look at death and say, even if, even if, even if my God doesn't save me, I will never bow to your idols. That is a process of day-to-day sacrifice, day-to-day commitment, day-to-day development, day-to-day saying, hey, this idol is not gonna work in my family. Because can I tell you something today, friend? You may not have set up the idol, but you can tear it down. Some of you have been given an idol that wasn't yours. You didn't ask for it. You haven't committed your life to it. It was passed down to you from your grandma. It was passed down to you from your daddy and I can tell you today listen I don't care what has been tossed your way it ends with you you have the opportunity to say I know there's some idols in my day I know there's some idols around me but I will not be the one to bow my knee can I tell you some scripture look at Moses he comes down from the mountain there's a calf a golden one that the Israelites are worshiping did Moses set up the idol no but he did tear it down look at King Josiah he inherits a whole generation of worship false worshipers and he goes I didn't set this up Where'd this come from? And what did he do? He tore it down. Look at Gideon. His father created an altar to Baal, but he didn't worship that altar. He cut it down. Oh, I wish three people in here knew what I was talking about. You cannot be the one to set it up, but you can be the one to bring it down. You can be the one that says, I grew up in a stingy family, but I'm gonna be generous. I grew up in a family where I had an abusive father, but my kids will never know that they do not love. They know they are loved. I know I might've grown up in so much dysfunction, but for me and my house, I will say, Serve the Almighty God. It is my turn. I didn't set it up, but I can tear it down. You want to be courageous? That's some courageous faith to tear down an idol you didn't set up. That's courageous. That wasn't in my notes. That was for somebody in this room. You've got to realize that God is looking for you to get a courageous faith like David, who's in the field and he's working so hard. He doesn't just kill a giant by luck. He kills a giant because he was tearing down things in the pasture. He killed a bear and a lion with his bare hands. Come on, somebody. He said, I'm out here just being developed so that when the moment came, he could bring down the giant that was hurting an entire nation. Your freedom isn't for you, it's for your family. Your freedom isn't for pursuits in the home, it's just for the whole nation, it's for the whole region, it's for the whole kingdom of the living God. This is not about a cute little church service. This is about people rising up in 2023 and saying, I've got a courageous faith on the inside of me. I'm not afraid to tear down an idol that's been set up in this region. I'm not afraid to tear down something I didn't put here, but I'm sure as heck not gonna let it stay here. I'm gonna build an altar to the living God. I'm gonna worship in my pain. I'm gonna worship in the season I didn't get to. God put me here, so I'm gonna stay here. This is the king that we serve. How can I say these things? This radical, I know, if you don't believe it, friend, people are like, I won't say it, I don't believe it. Say it until you believe it. I'm not gonna take anything down by living in the shadow and being afraid my whole life. I gotta step out of the shadow. I gotta say, no, 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 no. This is not how this works. It is time for you to be done. And this is the third thing I see. I see that you have to deal with your commitment issue. Stop worshiping idols. But you gotta locate the strength to stand. You gotta find it. You know what locate means? It means to find the exact location. Exact. It's kind of like a pressure point. Shut your whole body down, right? Somebody puts you on your shoulder, whoo, whole thing goes down. It is locating the point of pressure. It's like going to the chiropractor when they start hitting you and you're like, whoa, where'd that come from? And you don't even realize you had pain, but when they touched this one whole area, you went into fetal position, told me, God, take me home because it hurt so bad and you're like how does this work well there's a direct point of pain and what's crazy to me is that we live in a generation today where people think we got a faith problem agnostics atheists i don't have faith there couldn't be this i don't have faith here's the thing faith is placed somewhere we oftentimes think faith means christian not true very wrong let me help you let me break that booty in your head like hey listen it's not that not faith In that way, faith is a blind trust. So what's crazy to me is these people say, listen, I don't got faith. Yet those same people that tell me that fly on Spirit Airlines. (laughs) And they expect that the plane is just going to work out for them. It's the same type of people who, when the terms and conditions shows up, when they're signing up for a subscription, pretend like they read the whole thing, knowing what they're signing up for and just clicked, I accept the terms and conditions. I would say that's some faith. You don't know what you're signing up for. Uh, some of you put faith in the Uber to show up and pick you up when you paid for the Uber to show up and pick you up. And some of you, 
not talking from personal experience, have been let down by an Uber driver who didn't show up when I paid him to show up. But that's faith. And some of you in Seattle, you put faith in a burger from Dick's Drive-In. I don't know how they make it that fast. I don't know where it came from. I personally don't want to know, but I am not putting my faith in the burger from Dick's Drive-In. Just a reality. Not doing it. But, but you, I would say that that's faith. And so the problem, once again, is not a lack of faith. It's a location of faith. So the problem in our generation today, what we're seeing is people who have faith but are placing it in the wrong things. If you wanna get anywhere in life, you've gotta recognize that you've gotta set yourself up for success. And anybody who's ever gone on a diet knows that it's hard to get there. See, when you go on a diet, you are killing off certain things in your life. And you have to eat a kale smoothie when you don't eat a kale smoothie. And uh, it's disgusting, but you're looking for the result that you're gonna get, so you're committed to the kale smoothie. Um, but what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that your diet will determine your strength, okay? So for me, I, I've, I've, I've been doing this intermittent fasting thing. Very hard. Uh, and so uh, when I do it, I realize how much I snack. I realize that every time I watch TV, it's implied that I'm gonna eat, okay? And I realize that after 6 p.m., it just don't work like that. Uh, I can't do that, or else I break my ketosis, which is burning down fat cells. That's what my app tells me. And so I'm like, I, I, can't, I can't just break this up right now because, uh, uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm hungry and I'm craving something. And something else I've recognized about myself is I have a speed at which I like my food prepared. Fast, fast food. Um, and so the thing about fast food is that it is terrible for you. <laughs> it's cheap, but it has a cost. See, the McDonald's is cheap, but it's killing myself when I eat it. And, and what I've recognized is that if I want to become strong, I've got to create a diet in my life. It means that I've got to figure out what to consume. The disciples get confused when Jesus is talking. And he says, listen, it's no longer what you eat that matters. In the disciples' day, they had all these laws. They're like, homie, we've been intermittent fasting and cutting out fast food for 20 years. How are you gonna come and tell me that I can eat whatever I want? And Jesus says this. Do you know what he says? It's so gangster. He says, listen, friend, it's not what you eat that defiles you, but what comes out of your mouth. Do y'all know how vomit works? If you got children, you definitely know how vomit works. And uh, I got a nephew now, and so um, I've experienced how vomit works a little differently. And uh, the thing about vomit is that you only can throw up what you have. If you don't have anything in, you're just gonna dry heave. Which personally, I, I don't know if I prefer it or hate it when I'm the person that's vomiting because it's painful, but yet it's not as messy. So I, I don't know, we're not getting into that. So what I mean though is, is that when, when you vomit, what's inside of you is coming out of you. What's already been deep, 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 deep in this pit in your stomach is coming out of you. So here's what I think happens. I think somebody hurts me and I consume that and I don't deal with it. It was bitterness when it happened to me and then it sits in my stomach and it becomes acidic and then I release it as vomit called anger. Oh, oh somebody cut me off from every friend in our family, from every connection and relationship and I was disappointed, and I chewed on that disappointment, and it went into my stomach, and it became acidic, and then it came out as cruelty, because I'm just mean to people now. This is the life that we live, friend. We've got to find the diet that will make us have strength. We've got to locate the strength for us to stand. We've got to realize, listen, I can't just eat that. I got a vision for the strength that I want to have on the inside of me. I've got to be able to see courageous faith, knowing I'm at cowardly faith, and how am I going to get myself there by dieting correctly? So I'm sorry, friend, I can't watch that TV show with you because I know it's just not going to help me, and when I consume it, it might come out as a vomit. I'm not interested in saying, hey, listen, I know you hurt me, but guess what? I'm going to deal with this right now. I forgive you because I'm unwilling to eat the bitterness and let it come out as anger and disappointment and resentment. I'm just committing myself that I'm not going to eat garbage in because guess what? You're your mama told you this, when you put garbage in, garbage is gonna come out. You've got to recognize it's a diet that leads to your strength. What are you consuming? Oh, this is how I know. Because my homies, Rack Shack and Benny, they were on a diet, kale smoothies only. In uh, the first chapter of Daniel, we look back because I was trying to figure out how did they get to this place? And I feel like the Lord said they were working to get there. They didn't just show up one day. I know that's you today, that's me. You might be walking in here, man, I don't know what I got left. Can I tell you something? You're doing better than you think you are. Can I tell you something? You being right here is the best decision you can make. 
Can I tell you something? Getting a diet of coming to church on Sunday is important. Can I tell you, getting a diet of loving your kids and your family is important. Can I tell you, realizing the diet that God has placed in front of you is the thing you need to consume and don't consume the crap that the world's trying to feed you. Resist the McDonald's, Burger King, and fast food generation that's trying to kill you and realize there is more health to the inside of you. And I said, how did they get here? God, I love McDonald's. But you've called me (laughs) to do better things. I said, I want to have courageous faith. He said, Josiah, what are you eating? I was surprised by the weight that I had gained. This is why I started intermittent fasting. But then when I looked at my lifestyle, the things I was eating, the time I was spending, was I surprised at my body I shouldn't have been? And I recognized this is the same thing. So I look back in Daniel chapter one. These guys, Rack, Shack, and Benny, they're homies with Daniel. But Daniel disappears for this whole fiasco. Um, but you reap what you sow because he gets thrown in the lion's den a couple chapters later. Um, but these boys, they're with Daniel, and Daniel and, and these Hebrew boys have a covenant to God. And so they say, we're not going to eat the food from the king's table because the king wants to feed them wine and good food and beef them up just like everybody else in the land. And Daniel and these boys say, hey, listen, that would defile our God, and so we don't want to do it. And he talks to the chief of staff and says, hey, homie, listen, we're just going to eat fruits and vegetables because we feel like that's going to honor our God. The chief of staff says, that's not going to end up well for you. And I might lose my head because I'm supposed to feed you this food. And Daniel says, trust me. So for 10 days, all they eat is fruit and vegetables. And then watch this. After the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young man who had been eating the food assigned by the king. Friend, stay on that kale smoothie. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom, and God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. When the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel and the three homies. So they entered the royal service. Whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, I love this, he found them 10 times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in this entire kingdom. Listen to me. Courageous faith accepts the circumstances but challenges the outcome. A courageous faith says, I know the situation, but I'm gonna challenge the outcome. I know what it means for me to have to be on this diet and eat this food. I know what it means for me, King, if we don't bow down to your God, if we don't bow down to your statue, I know what you've communicated to me. You've communicated to me, King, that it's gonna cost me my life. You've communicated to me that it's gonna throw me in the fiery furnace. But King Nebuchadnezzar, I don't know if you understand this, but you said what God can save you from your power, I'm gonna let you know about a God who's got the highest power. And when I submit to him, no, he's not just gonna do something for me. I'm not even going to beg him to do it. It says, he is the God who is able to save us. That's what they say. He says he's able to save us. They don't put an expectation. They don't say he has to. They don't say we're going to give an offering so that he will. We just say he is able to. And friend, can I tell you, when you start to prophesy about the goodness of your God, when you look at death, when you look at the situation where you got to lay off a couple employees, when you look at the situation where your son or daughter is wayward and hasn't come home, when you look at the situation where you're addicted every night but you want to get off of it, when you look at the situation and say, I know I'm not righteous right now, but guess what God says about me? I am righteous even if I am stuck in this pit. And that's what these boys say. They say, even if our God doesn't save us, hey, I just want to let you know, we will never, no, never bow to your God. We will never, no, never bow to your God. I just want to let you know, because when we prophesy, when we speak his name, when we let him know who he is, that's the kind of faith that gets his attention. And all of a sudden, you know what happens? They get thrown into the fire. It's seven times hotter than they expected and Nebuchadnezzar looks up and he says what in the world is going on there's not three dudes in here hey didn't we throw three in here he says no there's four and the fourth one looks like a god and guess what they were doing they were walking around in the fire can I tell you something if they take my peace I'm still standing if they take my family I'm still standing if they take my comfort I'm still standing. 
If they wanna have my joy, they can have it, but I'm still standing. If they want that piece of me, they can have it, I'm still standing. If they wanna take my job, take my employees, they can have it, I'm still standing. I will worship in the pit. You know the fast track to get God's attention and irritate the devil? Start praising when you're going through it. Start shouting when it's really hard to do it because when you do that, that's a praise. God comes to inhabit and when he does, they're not just standing in the fire, they are walking around, they're having conversations. They're saying, listen, I can't wait for him to get us out of here because it's not about us going, I told you so. You see who he is. I just wish there were some people in here who know what I'm talking about that have seen God be faithful even when you haven't been. That have seen God do something for you when you were undeserving. And you saw God do something for you, even when you were mocking him, even when you were spitting on him, even when you told him he would never show up for you like that, even when you cursed him, I just know that that was me. I was far from him. But you know what I love? This is my last point. If you locate the strength to stand, he will give you the faith to walk. Because David says, even though I walk through the valley, and when you get past even if, friend, you're at an even though. When it's a real faith, when you're not trying to pretend to be something that you're not, when you let God speak to you and you've been developing a diet, you realize I'm not just standing, I'm walking. And I can have a conversation over here while I'm in my situation, in my pain, because God still sees me and he's every sacrifice I made. And he knows that when nobody else was looking, I was there calling on his name. You can go up and stand in this room. Go to your feet, everybody. Listen, I just feel like today, if we're gonna have a courageous faith, if we're gonna be standing in the pit, we're gonna be standing in the fire, if we're not gonna bow to the idols, then we've gotta give ourselves in full commitment to Jesus. Go ahead and bow your head, close your eyes in this room today. Maybe you've been serving God for a long time. Maybe you've been in church a long time. Can I tell you this morning, just because you've been in church doesn't mean you got an even if kind of faith. Just because you show up and check the box doesn't mean you can look at death in the face and say, even if my God doesn't save me, I just wanna let you know this is not to shame you, but I'm telling you, God wants every piece of you. What you withhold from him, the devil will hold over your head. You've gotta give him that piece of you that you've never surrendered. You gotta give him that piece of you that you've never sacrificed before. Today, some of you in this room, you've never given anything to Jesus. You're like, I don't even have any faith. Friend, can I tell you, you are in the best seat in the house. There's a God who loves you. There's a God who's for you. We were separated from him. He sent Jesus to pay the penalty for us. And he came and he saved us. But then he put the ball in our court and said, we've got to receive his love. We've got to accept him. And so today, if you feel right now in this pit of your stomach, whether you haven't been given everything to God or you haven't given anything to God, this is for you. All across this room, when I count to three, I want you to put your, your hand up and say, I'm standing, I'm standing, I'm not bowing. On the count of three, one, two, three. If that's you, just put your hand up. I see your hand, I see your hand. Hands all across this room, hands all across this room. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you right now. God, for a boldness and a faith that's coming to every believer in the Northwest. God, I thank you for some crazy people who are excited about what you're doing in their life. God, we thank you for those returning home today. God, we thank you for those coming back to you today. God, and we submit them to you. We say, God, would you use their life to write a beautiful story. God, would you do above and beyond what they could ever ask or imagine? We believe that you are God. We believe that you sent Jesus for our sin. We believe in our heart that you have been raised from the dead and we profess with our lives today we will be people of courageous faith. God, fill us with your spirit and use us to write a story like never before. Today, God, we turn our attention to you. Fill us. Fill us with your spirit. Give us boldness that we can stand to every idol in this region and say, sit down while I'm standing up in Jesus' name. All the church shouted amen. Man, so much. Thank you for being here at church today. If you feel like you need anything in your life, God was reaching into your heart just now. We have a team up here that are ready to pray for you. They wanna believe with you. If not, we'll see you next week. God bless you. Come on, let's bring our offering next week. Let's believe for God to go above and beyond. Let's have a courageous faith. God bless.